Thank you, I think. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite pleased with being called middle-aged. <laughs> I, I think that's an advance. Uh, it's my privilege to kick off the day. So welcome, everybody, to Yao. It's a great, great conference. I've seen some of the talks already uh, at, at, in Brisbane. Uh, and you're going to have a great day and, and a great conference, uh, and I hope you do. Um, I, I want to talk about um, some of the ideas that are more durable, the, the ideas that in our discipline help us to do a better job. And all of the ideas that I talk about, you're going to be familiar with already. I'm not going to be introducing some magic new technology or anything like that, but I want to talk about them in a way that I think he maybe might pique your curiosity and make you think a little differently about what it is that we do and how, it is, how we do it. Um, and that's my, that's, my, that's my aim for today, anyway. Uh, I'd like to begin by doing that slightly annoying thing that speakers sometimes do and get you engaged. So would everybody stand up, please? <clears throat> I'm going to ask you a question, and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you five answers. I'm going to, I want to ask you to categorize yourselves. And you may not fall, you may not fall neatly into the buckets. I'm assuming that most people in here at some point have been involved in programming of some kind. If you haven't, pretend you have. <laughs> uh, and so, um, so I'm going to ask you to kind of categorize. So when you think of yourselves, when you think of the job of somebody who, who creates software, do you think of them as a programmer? Do you think of them as a software developer, perhaps? Do you think of them as a craftsperson? Or maybe a meme wrangler or something else weird like that. I've come across a few of those in my time. Or do you think of yourselves as software engineers? So, if you think of yourself as a programmer, please sit down now. Thank you. If you think of yourself as a software developer, sit down now. If you think of yourselves as a meme wrangler or something equally strange, sit down now. Uh, we've got a few meme wranglers, we're nice. Craftsperson, sit down now. Okay, well, that's, that's quite a lot of people left standing that think of themselves as software engineers. My goal is that by the end of my talk, a few more people will be standing up if we did this again. Thank you very much for playing. Please, please, all, please all sit down. So who cares? Why does this matter? Why does the label that we assign to ourselves have any impact at all? And I think it, partly that is that some things are more important than just labels. I think this isn't just about the word that we use. I don't think that actually those descriptions, those different descriptions, are actually perfectly synonymous. I think there are some differences, or at least there ought to be, and particularly given the nature of my conversation, you know, my, my talk today, uh, when we start talking about engineering, I think that's a little bit different to the others. Uh, so let's take a look at that a little bit. So, so what is engineering? Uh, today I want to explore what, what we think engineering is in the round, you, you know, in general, but specifically in, in the context of software. And what are the kind of common principles that we might identify that characterize engineering rather than any other approach to, to doing complicated things? I want to present to you what I think, 10 guiding principles that I think that if we were to adopt them in all that we do, we would almost guarantee a better outcome. We wouldn't guarantee success, but we'd guarantee a greater chance of success. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that in other disciplines we would think of as, as engineering. And I want to talk about those. And then I want to talk a little bit about how we would apply those practically in software. So that's kind of my agenda for, for my talk. So let's begin with this idea of what, what do we think engineering might be. In other disciplines, this is, this, is, this, is a, this, is, this is a quote from somebody else, but, but in other disciplines, fundamentally, what we mean by engineering is just the stuff that works. And, and one of the things that I'm talking about, so engineering as a concept is, has, an, has a kind of ancient history. The word engineer comes from people actually building 
siege engines and, and you know, ballistas and stuff like that. But what I'm talking about is modern engineering, and specifically modern engineering in the sense that the, sort of the, the practical arm of science. It's the practical application of sort of scientific style reasoning is the way that I tend to think about it. Um, so, so engineering is the stuff that works, and if it doesn't work, we change it and we stop doing that, and we do something else to be engineering instead. Software is difficult on, on, on an unusual scale. In, in interesting and complex ways, it's a difficult thing to do. We are always just a few steps away from some quite deeply complicated ideas, whatever it is that we're doing in software. And so gain, adding the protections of some sort of organizing discipline that allows us to do a better job seems like a sensible thing. So what's the stuff that works for us? I've been talking about the, the, this idea of, of software engineering and, and musing on what it might be for a few years now. And I've been involved in a surprisingly large number of conversations that end up being about bridges. Uh, and they usually start with, yes, but software development isn't bridge building, is it? Well, of, of course, software development isn't bridge building. It's something else. Um, but then I, I think that that also means that we're not really clear what bridge building is. Bridge building is not just some kind of cookie cutter process. There are problems to be solved along the way. And that's doubly true if we're building the first kind of a bridge for the first time. If you're going to build, I don't know, a carbon fiber bridge between here and New Zealand, that's going to be a different kind of problem to just building a small bridge across a stream somewhere. There's going to be, there are going to be some differences there. And bridge building. And the engineering involved in bridge building is not the same as engineering involved in other engineering disciplines. Bridge building is not the same as automotive engineering. Automotive engineering is not the same as chemical engineering, and so on. So one thing that we can, can be pretty sure of is that if we were to come up with some kind of durable ideas that were foundational for us as engineering principles that would guide us toward better solutions, in part, they'd be specific to us. I think they'd be informed by, by other areas of engineering and other learning. Um, and in my talk today, I'm going to be pulling some examples from different engineering disciplines to just highlight some of the ideas that I talk about, because there is some generality in, in, in some sense, some, some analogues that we can take from uh, other forms of engineering. Oh, and I'm probably going to be talking about Lego a little bit as well. <clears throat> So what does this mean for us? What is engineering? Um, my preferred working definition is this. Engineering is the application of empirical scientific approach to, solving efficient, to finding efficient solutions to practical problems. And all of the words in that description matter. The efficiency matters, and that might be economic efficiency or energy efficiency or whatever, but, but that's part of engineering. They're, you're always constrained to some degree. Um, and this, kind of, uh, this, this practical application of scientific-style reasoning, I think, is deeply important. It, it, certainly, it, it is to the way that I think about this these days. Uh, to put it more simply, though, in other fields, engineering is just how we solve the hard problems. And I've already said, I think that software is up there. I, I, I think that, you know, uh, certainly when we start thinking about modern complex systems, this is difficult stuff. I, I don't believe that there will ever be a cookie cutter solution to building software. It's just not that simple. It takes smart people working in smart ways, doing, making intelligent choices with the best intellectual and tools and other kinds of tools available to them to do a good job. So I don't want to dismiss, dismiss that. And to be honest, that's one of the reasons why I enjoy it so much. I like it because it's hard. I'm OK with it being hard. But we ought, should ap be, a, apply some intelligence to the way in which we apply ourselves to solving these problems in software. The other way of thinking about this is that engineering is the foundation on which our high-tech civilization is built. And I mean that in a very, you know, a very fundamental way. We've existed as a distinct species for somewhere between 200 and 300,000 years. And on almost any scale that we measure progress 
It's been a flat line for 200 or 300,000 years. It started ticking up a few, year, a few hundred years ago, and that was with the birth of science and the, the kind of modern engineering that I'm talking about. Here's a graph of um, technological advancement, um, uh, graphed uh, over you know, a, a short period of that, on that time scale. Uh, this is where science started. Here's, here's another collection of graphs. Uh, these are, there's, uh, on this graph, there is life expectancy, GDP per capita, a percentage of not living in extreme poverty, war-making capacity, um, living in democracy, all sorts of measures. But here's where science started. Something important happened at this point in our civilization. Here's another graph. This is the graph of, of the rate at which human knowledge doubles. At the start of the 20th century, human knowledge was doubling every century. By 1945, knowledge doubled every 25 years. By 1982, it was doubling every 12 to 13 months. And estimates today say that knowledge is doubling every 11 to 12 hours. So what happened? So science is, science is off there somewhere, off in that direction. And computers and software are about here. So there's something important going on. And I don't think we can afford to dismiss the impact of engineering-style thinking on solving the hard problems. So, what's engineering really for? What does it give us? And I think this is, this is it's something different to what we often think about in this, in this sense. I, I think that often what we think about of engineering, what we expect of engineering, is that it defines the solutions for us. And it doesn't do that. It never does that. What engineering does instead is rule out the stupid solutions. It, it closes off the daft things that we shouldn't be doing and then leaves the spectrum open for a whole range of choices that might be successful. So it never gives you, it's not the kind of cookie-cutter churn-the-handle process that's going to spit out the answer. That's not how engineering works. Engineering is a process of discovery. And part of, part of that discovery is to rule out the dumb ideas. One of the other mistakes that I think that we've made as an industry is to confuse what it is that we do with what it is that other people have done before. And that's perfectly understandable. Uh, but if you are in the process of trying to build physical things, then the, the job of actually you know, producing the physical thing at scale, at a certain level of quality, is the hard part. That's not a problem that we ever have. That's not our job. That's not our problem. Think about what it is that we do. We write some code, and then whatever the nature of the system that we're building, that code is going to spit out a stream of bytes, ultimately. However big or complex the system, it's represented as a stream of bytes. And one of the unique properties of digital assets, and code in particular, is that we can clone perfectly a stream of bytes for essentially zero cost, or such a low negligible cost that it's not worth worrying about. So we don't have a production problem ever, because production for us is just clone the bytes. Our problem is the design problem at the start. It's the, it's the creation of that first stream of bytes, and then from then on, production is free. That's a very different kind of thing, a very different kind of process than a traditional application of production line thinking. So production line style techniques make no sense whatsoever in our context. And what's waterfall development if it's not a production line for software? It's just a dumb idea. It's a misapplication of, of thinking to, to our problem. So you know, we can just press the button, clone the bytes, and, and, and off we go as many times as we like. So, 
What engineering is really about is about learning and discovery. It's about trying to figure out, trying to rule out those dumb answers and trying to navigate towards the better answers that might work for us, whatever, whatever it is that our problem is. I would say that's exactly the same thing for software development. So I think that absolutely engineering style thinking is applicable to what we do. And it's become kind of fashionable, certainly in some quarters in software development, to, 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 to not, not see it that way. But I think it's true um, that applying this kind of thinking gives us a better direction of travel. So what is the stuff that works? Well, first, if what I've said is correct, then what we, the implications of that for us is that we need to become experts at learning, world-class experts at learning. That should be at the foundation of our job. That's what, where our core skills should be in learning, our ability to be able to figure out what it is that our customers want from, from, from our software, figure out how we're going to achieve that in terms of design and implementation, figure out how we're going to deal with the information that we gather and how to use it and what it means figure out whether our software is secure, figure out whether it's got bugs in it, all of those things. But that's all of those things are about learning. So we need to optimize to, to be able to do that. The other part of software systems that I've already referred to a few times is that they're enormously complex. And so the other area, the other foundational aspect of what it is that we do is that we must become experts at managing complexity. We need to use the tools that allow us to make change in one part of the system without being scared to death of the impact of that in another part of the system. So we need to be able to figure out how to do those things. In each of those categories, I've got five ideas that I think contribute to helping us build that expertise. And these are all ideas, as I said at the start, that you will be familiar with already. But I'm, being, I'm not just flagging them and saying, hi, iteration is nice. I'm saying, you optimize for, it, for better iteration in everything that you do, and you'll get a better outcome. You optimize for faster feedback in everything that you do, and you'll get a better outcome. That's what I'm saying. So I'm saying that these are the principles on which we can make better decisions that will guide us in better directions. So let's look at those principles and, and see what they mean, with a few examples along the way. We probably think of something like this, the, 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 the invention of the aeroplane, as a, a statement of craft. And, and certainly it kind of was. The, the Wright brothers were bicycle makers and so on. But actually bicycles were quite high-tech devices at that point in history. And they were engineers and they were advancing the science of flight as well as doing the practical craft-based production of the first aircraft. Um, they, for example, advanced the, the theory. They, they, they added to the, the, the lift-drag equation that, that, that people were using to understand how, uh, how aeroplanes fly. They built the first wind tunnel in order to be able to experiment with models on, on, on the aerofoil shapes for, for, for the wings of their test pieces. And they used prototypes in all sorts of different ways to try out their ideas. So they were experimenting, they were trying out different ideas, and they were doing this in a fairly rigorous, disciplined way to, to enhance their learning. The other thing that we can certainly say is that at this point in history, in aviation, these things were death traps. A very high proportion of the early aviation pioneers were killed by the, the, the things that they were trying out. The, one of the Wright brothers was killed in a, in a flying accident. Um, but what happened, the, another interesting aspect of working iteratively, making change over time, is that you get to improve things. And what happened in aviation, we iterated, often with great pain, as a result of accidents that killed people. We learned from those accidents, we refined the, the design and the approach to the engineering of the aircraft until they got better and better and better. We got to aircraft like this that could be, take passengers on long-distance flights in some degree of comfort until we get to a modern jet aircraft, which is a safer place to be than we are now sit, sitting in this room. In 2017, two third, the equivalent of two-thirds of the population of the planet flew on commercial airliners, and not one person was killed in an accident. 
That's remarkable. That's the first time that happened, and that's the fruits of engineering. It's this iterative process of refining and refining and refining and refining and refining that goes on, in this case, for a century and a bit of, of improvements. That's how engineering works. Iteration is, at a more technical level, is a deeply powerful idea. If we've got a goal of some kind that we'd like to achieve, and we're starting from some point, in order to hit that goal, what do we need to do? We could come up with some complex plan and figure out how to get there and all that, but the better way of doing it is this. We just define a fitness function. We have some kind of fitness function that says, does this change, whatever the change might be, move us closer to the goal or further from the goal? And if we've got a fitness function and then we start iterating, we can hit the goal. So any idea that goes away from the goal, we discard. Any idea that moves us closer to the goal, we keep. And we move on from there. And this works even if you move the goal, even if you change the goal, as long as you change the fitness function along with it. So this is an open-ended approach to doing better, to improving the system. This is deeply powerful, and it feels, it feels less rigorous. It feels, it feels much cleverer to think really hard and come up with some grand plan, but it's not. That's a dumb idea. This is a much more powerful way of doing things. In fact, in essence, this is how evolution works. This is how machine learning works as well. We set up these fitness functions, and we kind of try a bunch of stuff, and we discard the ideas that are dumb ideas and keep the, the ideas that are, that are good ideas. What this means is there's a very profound philosophical difference between this kind of approach to problem solving and the one that I keep rubbishing, the more kind of traditional plan-based waterfall-style thinking. A waterfall-style approach is based on the assumption that you know the answer at the start. This kind of approach makes the assumption that whatever we know right now is probably wrong. But our job now is to figure out as quickly and efficiently as we can how it's wrong, and then we'll correct for it. That's a much more powerful way of working. And that's how science works, too. The next in my list is the idea of feedback. And feedback, certainly in my example, is pretty simple. It's just the measure that we're making of whether we've, you know, on, on, the, on, on the level of the fitness function in one way. Feedback's a really powerful idea in terms of, in terms of driving change. I, 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 these days, I, I spend less of my time actually writing software and more of it advising organizations on how to go do a better job of writing software. And one of the things that I do to help them to do that is to just keep repeating over and over again, improve your feedback, improve your feedback, speed up your feedback, get higher quality, faster feedback, because that will drive change in your organization. By moving faster in smaller cycles, you'll drive out the things that get in the way and you'll fix them. If you, your release process takes six months, Start releasing every three months and see why that's painful. Fix the pain points and then start releasing every month and drive out the pain points and so on. It's a really good strategy. Again, this is one of those ideas that's, that's a little bit more uh, to it than, than, than meets the eye. It seems, maybe, it, that the idea of just looking and observing and seeing whether something was good or bad seems a little bit ad hoc. It seems a little bit less intelligent, maybe, but it's not. Let's think that we're given, let's imagine we're given the problem of balancing a broom. And there are two ways that we could go about doing that. We could kind of do the, 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 the waterfall planned way. So we could, we could measure the center of mass of the broom, and we could kind of figure out exactly where that, that point is. And then we know that in order to be able to balance something, what we need is we need to organize the broom so that the, the, the line through, you know, of gravity through, needs to go through the center of the mass and the point of contact, where, wherever that's going to uh, land. So we could carefully position that. And then with great skill and enormous accuracy, we could try and position the broom so that there was no impulse left, so that it was not wobbling one way or another. And if we were brilliant and perfectly right, maybe the broom would balance. But that's not very likely in reality. What's much more likely is it's just going to fall over because there's only one solution to that problem, practically. What we'd all do in reality 
is if we were given this problem, is something different entirely. We'd, we'd, we'd simply pick the broom up, we'd put it on our hand, and we'd kind of start wobbling our hand around and sort of seeing which way the broom tilted and react to the broom tilting. That's feedback in action. And the reason that that works is because there are lots of solutions to that problem. I could move my hand a little bit to correct, to correct. I might overcorrect, and then I could move it back. I could, if I, get, if I have a very fast cycle, the amount that I have to move is much smaller. If I have a big cycle, I can kind of cope with big changes. If I know came up on the stage and shoved me while I was moving the broom, I could stagger, and I could probably still balance the broom. All this would work. In fact, this works so well that this is the way that space rockets work. Space rockets do essentially this. They balance the thrust, they have inertial guidance systems that measure the position of the space rocket, and they, they, they're able to gimbal the thrust where it points to react to the balances. So it's the equivalent, it's exactly the same thing as balancing a broom on your hand. So this is a much more powerful idea than just thinking hard and pretending you're a genius. This is better. Next in my list is the idea of incremental uh, uh, development. And this is a picture of the first module of the International Space Station. There's an argument about what the most complicated machine that we've ever built is. Um, some people might say it's the Large Hadron Collider. Some people usually say it's the International Space Station. I'd actually say it's the internet. But, uh, but, but you know, this, this, is a, this is a reasonable shout for, for certainly a complicated machine. And they started off with, with one module, which they put into space, and then they added some more, piece by piece. So they're, they're effectively, this engineering is a process of evolution. Where they ended up, they certainly had a rough plan that it was going to end up like that, but they also certainly changed their minds along the way, and the plans changed a little bit. There are new bits that weren't thought of at the point at which the, 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 the International Space Station started to be built. It, it, it docks with different spacecraft that didn't even exist when, when, it was, when, it was, when it was in conception. And so this is how engineering progresses, incre incrementally. We have the power to do this even more so because software is so much more ma malleable. So you could think of this as kind of a process of directed evolution. Our job is not to come up with the perfect solution and imagine that you know, fully formed in our minds. It's to start off with a rough idea of the target that we want to go in, and we start moving in that direction using iteration and feedback and working incrementally, and we build on known good steps over time. That's how engineering of complex systems really works. Here's another little example. This is a picture of the first iPhone, which was a revolutionary device. This was an amazing thing at the time, and phones didn't look like this before this, and now all phones look like this. Uh, pretty much. This is the original one, and you know, it, was, it was amazing, but there were no third-party applications, no GPS, no video, no FaceTime. It was a crude device compared to the thing that you know, we've all got in our pockets now. Um, I'm sure at the point at which Apple the engineers in Apple started working on this. They had some fanciful of ideas of things that they might add to the iPhone. I'm equally sure that they had no real clue of what the destination of what today's iPhone would be. It's changed over time. That's how engineering works. This is the 4S. This was kind of a, a step along the evolutionary uh, journey. There was no 4G, no Siri, no face recognition, no Apple Pay. And this is a modern Model 14. And he's got, you know, remark he's got LiDAR and ridiculously powerful cameras and all sorts of clever, you know, face recognition techniques and all sorts of things that I'm certain that the engineers at the start hadn't foreseen, and we're not foreseeing what comes next. Again, this is the idea of working incrementally, and it's a process of learning and discovery all along. There's no finished here, really. The next in my list of ideas to allow us to optimize for learning is the idea of being experimental. 
And when I say this to some kinds of organisations, some people in organisations, this scares the hell out of them because they say things like, oh, yes, we can't be experimental, we can't afford to fail. And that seems insane to me, if I'm honest, because if you can't afford to fail, you can't afford to do, succeed either. <laughs> because how on earth do you make progress if you're not taking a risk in some way? If you know the answer before you start, you're not learning anything, and therefore you're not really doing anything. You're just perpetuating your current state of knowledge in products, in techniques, in technology, whatever it might be. So if we're going to um, make changes and want to advance our products and our systems and our ways of working, we must experiment. We must take the risk of failure. But we do it in a controlled way. We do it in a sensible way where it's not going to damage us. One of the superpowers of science is that you learn more when your experiment fails than you do when it succeeds. If you make a prediction and your experiment validates your prediction, maybe the prediction's right. Maybe your experiment was crap. How do you know? If you do the experiment and your experiment fails, then maybe your experiment was crap again. Maybe that, that could be true still. But maybe now you've just proved that your idea was wrong. Now you're challenged to think harder about what the right idea is. That's how, we, that's how we as a species make progress in knowledge. That's how we as a species make progress in engineering too. Part of being experimental, so part of the definition really of being experimental, is the idea of controlling the variables. Making sure that when we're trying stuff out, we limit the scope of, of our trial so that we can better spot whether it works or not. So controlling the variables is a really important part of being experimental. There's a practical demonstration of this, again, from the aviation industry. For decades and decades, if you wanted to introduce a new aircraft, you didn't just build the aircraft and then send somebody flying in it and say, how did that do? Did they survive or not? You, carried, you controlled the variables a bit more than that. And there's, there's, an, there's, a, there's an old... Um, philosophy, I suppose, in, in aircraft design, that you never try a new airframe with a new power plant. You try a new power plant in an old airframe, and you try a new airframe with an old power plant. So what you'd do is that you'd have an, airplane, an old airplane like this, you'd take the engine off, and you'd put the new air engine onto the airplane, and then some poor test pilot would go and fly it, and if he survived, you'd think that the experiment worked, and, and you'd learn from it, and then Later on, you'd, you'd, you'd try the, the new airframe and you'd bolt the old engine onto the front of the, the, the new airframe and you'd go for somebody would go and fly that and try that out. And now you've learned. You've, you've learned more by controlling the variables. You understand better what's good and bad about both of the pieces. And ultimately, when you've got the bugs out, you can put all the bits together and you've got a new airplane. That's really how progress was made for a very long time um, uh, in, in, airplane, in aircraft engineering. The last in my list of five ideas to optimize for learning is being empirical. Um, uh, one of the differences, I think, between pure knowledge acquisition from science and the kind of knowledge acquisition that we do in engineering is that our stuff's got to work in the real world. Uh, and that's kind of true of science as well, but in a much more practical sense, it's true of us. So in traditional engineering, if you're building an aeroplane or a space rocket or a car, you might do all of the theory stuff. You might do lots of maths. You might run computer simulations. But then you're going to build the real thing. You're going to try it out in the real world before you let it loose in, on, on people in the wild. Another old aviation approach was that the engineers that designed the aeroplane would be on one of the very early flights during the prototyping stage so that they got some skin in the game. Um, before pa real, you know, real paying passengers went on, on, on the aeroplanes. Being empirical is an interesting idea, and, and there's another. This is, this is the, one of the first early jet aircraft. This was, a, this was during the Second World War. This is a German Heinkel, um, and they, they did what 
I've described, they first tried the jet engine in an old airframe, and then they, they tried, uh, they bolted um, a, a, an old propeller on the front of this thing and flew that. One of the things to notice about this is that this is what pilots call, or aircraft engineers call, a tail dragger arrangement of the undercarriage. The, the, there's a little wheel at the back, and the nose is tilted up, that's a design choice that's the result of having propeller engines with big propellers on the front. It gives room for the propeller so the propeller doesn't hit the ground. And so here's one of the first jet aeroplanes, and because everybody's just used to having tail dragger arrangement, that's what they did. And so when they went and test flew this, it melted the runways. <laughs> So now, if you look at a modern jet aircraft, they're all stood up. They've, they've moved the center of gravity where the wheels are. They've got a little wheel at the front rather than a little wheel at the back. And they stand on like a tripod. And the, the line of the engines is horizontal so it doesn't melt the runways. That's empirical learning. They went and tried it out. They melted the runway. said, damn, that wasn't a good idea. Let's try something new. A more recent example of being empirical is SpaceX. This is, a, this is the Starship. This is the uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX's reusable um, spaceship. That's the aim of this project. The aim is to build a wholly reusable uh, spacecraft that ultimately will take people to the moon and to Mars and to live on other planets. That's, that's the, um, the ambition. Uh, this, is, this is after a 15-kilometer flight, and this version of the spaceship didn't make the landing, <laughs> as you can see. And again, they will have done computer simulations, they will have crunched the numbers, they will have done the maths, but still you try it out. Still you, 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 you check to see what's, how this works. One of the reasons that you do this in physical engineering is because your simulations might be wrong. One of the other superpowers that we have is that our simulations won't be wrong, because what we're trying out, the computer models that we're trying out, are our product. So we don't quite have this problem, but nevertheless, we still need to learn from production. We still need to learn from the real world. Does our stuff really work? Can we observe what's going on? Can we capture data and learn from that data? I've said already that modern software is often complex. The picture of the Amazon, with the Amazon logo at the top there, that's a picture of microservices in, um, in the Amazon uh, cloud, of their own microservices. And that, you know, if you, that's, that's just a snapshot, because in reality, that's dynamic. It's changing all of the time, because there's new versions of services popping into existence and being pulled from production all of the time. It's hellishly complex. Uh, I would argue that, you know, the, the, the software systems are the most complex things that human beings create. And they're weirdly fragile and difficult, so we should be applying, approaching these things with some degree of caution, I suppose. So software development is about learning and about managing complexity. So let's look at the ideas for managing complexity. And again, here are my five. And again, these are all ideas that you're familiar with. Uh, but uh, uh, I will repeat, I'm not saying, ha, oh, aren't these cool? I'm saying, use these as tools. In every decision that you make, prefer a solution that ends up with your code being more modular. In every decision that you make, prefer a solution that ends up with your code being more cohesive. Make the separation of concerns a guiding design principle that drives your choices when you're building things. Aim to reduce the coupling in the organizations where you work so that teams can work more independently of one another. These are guiding principles that can make us make better choices. Let's look at modularity. A modular system allows us a bunch of freedoms. We can go and tinker with the internal workings of one part and not worry about what's going on in another part. We can replace one module with another. We could have a different jet engine. We could replace this version of a jet engine with a new, more fuel-efficient version to the same airframe, and that would save some money. It allows us to focus. There are engineers whose job is to understand about the jet engine, and they don't know how the rest of the airplane works, really, to the same degree. And so it gives us all of those kinds of freedoms. We can make changes in one place and then not leak out and affect everywhere else. 
This is equally true of more what we might think of as more deeply coupled devices. Even though a mod, something like a modern uh, smartphone is a deeply integrated technical piece of technical wizardry, it's still made up of a series of discrete parts, each with, with a specified task. And those are designed to that task and interface with the other parts through well-defined points in the architecture of the design. A, a place more close to home, perhaps, for us is the idea of printer drivers. When I, as I know, alluded to very kindly by calling me middle-aged, I'm actually more than that, um, when I started writing software um, for what were then called microcomputers, um, if you wanted to print something out on a printer, you had to know which printer you'd got, and you had to write the code in assembler, usually, to drive the printer, because there wasn't such a thing as a printer driver. That came later. And that's an idea, that's, a, that's an, a, a practical application of modularity. Operating system vendors decided that they'd draw a line of abstraction that represented printing. They'd reduce the coupling between the printer and the software that wanted to print. And then you could have a module that you could kind of plug in underneath those things that would, you know, would, would, would for one kind of printer, and then you could replace that with another kind of printer. And your word processing software or whatever else that wanted to print didn't care about any of that shit. It just printed stuff. So this is a powerful idea, and we can apply this almost everywhere in the software that we write, and when we do, we end up with better software. Here's, a, here's an example. This is a piece of code that I usually use to poke fun at. This, in this piece of code, in, in this context, here, the, the, the kind of brownie-orange bit is 361 lines in an if statement. This is somewhat less than modular code. This, this is what it looks like if you kind of zoom out. Anybody want to work on that piece of code? <laughs> Not really. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yeah, and the, the commonest feedback that I get when I show people this is, oh, yeah, we've got longer ones than that. <laughs> That's not a good thing. So if we look at this a bit more closely, if we start looking at what that if statement is, it looks like this. So if unlikely bang CI, everybody clear now? <laughs> I think after poring over this for a little while, I think that what this actually should have said is, if there's no connection, create a connection. And if I just do that, if I don't do anything else, if I use the extract method refactoring in my IDE, and I only do that, I've made this code better in a single step. It's now more modular. It's now, it's now more useful. It, when I looked around the code that uh, this was ripped out of context, there were other things that looked vaguely like they were creating connections. Now I could start to think about reusing that piece of code that I've named and labeled and is isolated and focused on creating a connection. I could use it again. So this is a much better code, even with this one tiny change. My favorite description uh, of software design comes from Kent Beck. A good design is about moving the things that are unrelated further apart and the things that are related closer together. <laughs> it's, I'm fairly sure he meant it as a joke when he said it, but it's also deeply true. Uh, that is profoundly what a good design looks like. And the moving the things that are unrelated is modularity, and moving the things that are related closer together is cohesion. We want, we want, and both of these help us to better understand the code, better work on it, without tripping over ourselves and making mistakes. One of the tools that I've come to love and, and have adopted strongly in the way that I work is the idea of separation of concerns. Each part of the system should be focused on solving one part of the problem. And I learned this from my friend Martin Thompson because he's got a laser beam focus on separation of concerns. If you work with Martin, as soon as he notices that this piece of code is doing two things, he's busy ripping it apart and trying to figure out how to get them, get them out and, and separate them. And I, I got addicted to that as well. Here's another practical example. This is a modern electric BMW. 
And one of the choices that BMW have made is that they've separated the concerns of the platform, the transmission, the, the battery storage, the electric motors, the steering, all of that stuff from the, the shell, the, 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 the utility of the car. And so yet yeah, they have a single, their, their aim is that they're going to have a single platform, this thing, and then they're going to build a whole bunch of different shells. So if you have a, an estate car or a sedan or a sports car, they're all going to be built on the same platform. That gives them a lot of flexibility. It means that they can optimize in one part of the system without worrying about other parts. As long as you've got these interface points well established, it gives you a huge degree of utility uh, to, to be able to do this kind of thing. Separation of, of concerns gives us greater focus and clarity, and it's a tool that will increase, drive better modularity and better cohesion into our designs. Next in my list is the idea of abstraction. And here's another car. I, I, I find this one quite cute. It's quite, this is one of the very early cars. Before, there'd been sort of standardization of, um, of controls or, or anything, really. This is very, very early on. This thing here, I think, if, if, I, if I'm interpreting what's going on here correctly, that's both the throttle and the brake in a single control. And this thing here that looks a bit like a tiller, because it is a tiller, is, is the steering mechanism. And you can actually see how that works. You can see how that's connected, and you can see it goes down to the bottom of that pole, and there's a little lever that's connected through another little lever to the, the wheel on the front to, to make the steering work. There's not much abstraction going on there. And then what happened was we started to standardize the controls, and we started to, to make the controls a little bit more abstract. Um, and here's, a, here's an early steering wheel, and this is closer to what we'd recognize as a steering wheel now. You can still tell it's in an old car. It's, it's got a funny thing in the middle that I think is about mixture control for the engine, but it's got pedals on the floor in the similar way that we'd have in a stick shift car now, and it's got a gear stick and all those sorts of things. And then gradually, we'd evolve those to something that ends up being more modern. How does that steering wheel, the one in the middle, work? You don't know, because it's an abstraction. It could be that there's some kind of parallelogram steering system or a rack and pinion mechanical steering system behind that steering wheel. Or it might be that it's power-assisted, probably more likely, and, that, and there's some kind of hydraulic connection to the wheels that move the wheels. Or if it's a modern car, it might even be electric and, and moderated by a computer. The abstraction has removed us from the detail. In order to be able to use the car, um, we don't need to know. We don't, we don't need to know how all of that stuff works behind the scenes. And that's a good thing. It allows us to steer the thing, and, 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 and it allows us to have transferable skills between different versions of cars and all sorts of things that, that help us then just hide some, some aspects of what it is that we're talking about when we're thinking about systems like this. Let's look at some code, uh, you know, or, or, or more code-like stuff. Here's, here, here's interactions between two modules of code. There's a whole bunch of stuff about initializing and saying it's initialized and get delivery date and returning a delivery date, get some VAT. This is not at all abstract. There's, a, there's also some nasty coupling at the bottom straight to the database. This is just a pretty ugly stuff, right? It would be nicer. It would be more understandable. It would be easier to change, easier to work on, if this was better abstracted. So if we did something like this instead, we say, we're going to place an order, and then we'll just be told when the order's placed. Now the thing in orange is, a, is, is just kind of arm's length with respect to the thing in blue. Now the thing in orange can change in all sorts of ways without hitting on the, 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 the thing in blue. That's quite good. That's nice. That's managing the complexity in our systems in a way that allows us to do work. We'd like our software to keep secrets. We'd like one part of the software not to have to know all of the detail of what's going on in another part of the software. 
and that should be important. We should be doing that all of the time at every resolution. That should be true at the levels of functions and, and methods, as well as at the level of modules and classes. But certainly, when we're talking at the things like the level of services, services shouldn't know what's going on inside another service and shouldn't be tied to that. We want those to be more independent than that. These are more important parts in the architecture of our system, so we should be taking more care to abstract them and to isolate at those points. Do a little bit more work in order to be able to manage the complexity at those points in our designs. And one of the reasons for this is to manage the coupling. Now, when I first started writing down my list, I wrote loose coupling, and that's not quite right. Coupling is always there. There's always coupling there, and depending on the nature of the system, sometimes tight coupling might be a good idea, but you need to make that conscious decision. Here are two systems. I told you I'd talk about Lego. These are both Lego products, and the one on the right is the kind of Lego bricks that I played with with a child, and I play with my granddaughters with these days, and we build buildings and dinosaurs and submarines and cars, and all of them in our, my imaginations and my four-year-old granddaughter builds some amazing thing, and I say, oh, that's lovely, what is it? <laughs> and she says, it's a giraffe. And you say, oh, of course it's a giraffe. Because, you know, we can just interpret it any way that we want. The thing on the left is different. If I wanted to build a submarine from that kit, I can't. That's deeply coupled. There's, there's one way of assembling that that's the right answer. And if I get one piece out of place, that it's not solve the problem. So this is a much more fragile system than the system on the right. The system on the right has many, many, many more solutions than the system on the left. So coupling matters and, we, and is a tool that we should use appropriately. So in general, we should always worry about coupling because cu coupling is one of the devils in software. It's one of the things that really trips us up. Uh, but we, my advice is to think carefully about coupling, but with a preference for looser coupling is the way that I'd put it these days. Here's a simple example of that. So uh, I've just released version two of my orange module, and I've changed the date format uh, in that. In the first version of the interaction, that's going to break the world. Um, that's, that's not going to work. Um, we've screwed up everything now. In the second version, I've got some more options. Because, these are, these, because of the abstraction, these are more decoupled with respect to each other, or they can be. So I could do something uh, like this. So I could put um, a little adapter in the way between the interaction between the two services, and that could be a translation point. I could have two versions of that, one that had the version two date and one that had the version one date. I could support that if I wanted to. Um, and now, when I place the order, I still get back the version one date because I've got a translation point. I've decoupled the two pieces. I can change them more independently of one another. So let's look at applying these guidelines. Here are all of the... The, the ideas that we've been talking about. These are not just motherhood and apple pie. These are tools that we can use to, to, to express these ideas. Here's some code. So this, here's a car, and this is a car with a petrol engine, and it's got a start method. We're going to put this into neutral, apply the brakes, and then start the engine. So let's write a test. Um, I'm going to create my car. I'm going to start the engine, and damn, there's nothing I can test. Um, I could try and break encapsulation and get access to that private engine variable, but that would be really nasty. Don't want to do, I don't want to do anything as disgusting as that. So that's not great. So we, could I change by making my code more testable? Could I, could, I, could, I, could I get a better outcome? So let's start with a test instead of starting with the code. So the first thing, that, well, the thing that I'd really like to say is, did the engine start? I know that one, so I'm going to write that down first. Uh, and then when that, that's going to be true when the car has been started. So I'm going to create a better car, and in order to be able to ask the engine whether it started or not, I need access to the engine. So yes, all I'm doing is I'm talking about dependency injection. But that was driven by the, my desire to make the code testable. 
So now I've got this better car, and I, I'm going I'm to in, inject an engine of some kind. I'm going to inject a fake engine. So here's my fake engine. And all this does is that when I, when I start the engine, it just flips a Boolean flag, and then I can say, was the engine started successfully? And that's what my test does. That simple move. So first, the whole process I've described was iterative. I was using feedback in, on, on my design to make choices along the way. And I evolved the solution bit by bit by bit in order to be able to, to, to build this out. I know this is a trivially simple example, but this is the way that I work for more complicated examples too. Um, so I, I've ended up with this better car. Um, and this is better in, in, in a very simple way. But as a result of this simple change, I've made the code more modular. The, the better car knows less about petrol uh, uh, engines than the car did, because it, it doesn't need to know about how to create a petrol engine. Um, it's more abstract, because I'm talking to an engine abstraction that's just general and generic. It's more loosely coupled for the same reason. Um, it's got a better separation of concerns because all of the stuff here is really the essentials of the car and there's less about the engine. And in particular, I don't need to know anything about how to create the engine. So all of those properties that we value have been amplified by striving to make my code more testable. That's another kind of thing that we'd expect from an engineering style discipline. If we follow a bunch of rules, we get a better outcome. If we use test room development, I would argue that we design better code because it applies a pressure on us to write better code. The implications of this are that, as a result of that, this code is better in some really practical ways. I can do exactly what I did before, and I can create a car with a petrol engine, and it's the same as it was before, it's just the code's better. But I could now, it's more flexible. It's better because it's more flexible. I could use it in a wider variety of circumstances. Because of the modularity, when we, like when we were talking about jet engines, I can swap this out. I can replace the uh, petrol engine with an electric engine. Or if I'm some kind of per crazy person, I could replace it with a jet engine if I wanted to. And the car would still be correct. The engine would still be correct. We've got a better separation of concerns here. All of these good things. So. I'm slightly over time, I know, but I'm going really quickly. <laughs> um, these are the, my 10 principles that I think, if we adopt them, they will steer us towards a better outcome. I just want to, I would like you to imagine for a moment two different versions of your project. You're going to start off with, faced with some problem, and you're going to think really, really hard, and you're going to come up with all of the answers before you start work, and then you're going to execute, and you're not going to look to see whether it's working or not. You're just going to go all the way to until you're finished, and then you stopped. Is that likely to work? Or you're going to iterate. You're going to start off trying stuff out, seeing what works, gathering feedback, carrying out experiments, learning along the way, which one of those two is more likely to give you success? The second one, right? Then think about a version of the code. Imagine the code that you work on, perhaps, and imagine a version of it that's all in one big file. There's all, all of the variables are global. Um, all of the, 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 there's no lines of demarcation, really, between one part of the code and another. The cohesion's poor. There's bits to do with calculating tax spread all through the code or whatever else it is. And then think of another one that's modular. And each module is focused on solving one part of the problem and is loosely coupled via abstraction from other parts of the problem. Which version of the code would you work on? Which one would be more efficient? Which one would be easier to change? I guarantee that you're thinking the second one would be better. And just think for a moment. I haven't said anything at all about the technology. I haven't said anything at all about the nature of the problem that you're solving. But all of these things are still true. I, I, I really doubt that there's anybody that would disagree that the second version in both of those examples would be a better place to work. That seems like an important idea to me. These things matter for one reason, and this is the idea that I would like to leave you with. 
They allow us to change our software. Change is endemic in, in software development. Everything changes all of the time. And there's no getting away from that. That's not our fault. That's not because we were stupid at the start. Even if we were brilliant at the start, the world's going to change. The conditions are going to change in which our environment works. The team's going to change that's working on it. We're going to change our minds about what the design should be. And if we don't, we're not doing a very good job. We ought to be making changes. JavaScript frameworks change all of the time. All of these things change. And so we must embrace change, as Kent, ben Kent Beck famously said. I would, the idea I want to leave you with is that the quality of the system is defined by our, our ability to change it. That's it. Of course, there are other things that matter. We need to be writing systems that work. We need to be writing systems that give commercial advantage for our organizations. We need to be systems that are secure, safe, all of those things. But if you can't change your software, you're never going to put those things into the software. If you can change your software, you might be able to put those things into the software. So the first principle is to keep our software in a state where we can change it easily and continually and learn from it. Thank you very much. It's the end of my talk. Have a fantastic <laughs> conference. <laughs>